Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Triangulation is brought to you by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Triangulation with Tom Merritt and Leo Laporte. Episode 33, recorded November 30th, 2011. Kevin Marks, Part 1. Triangulation is brought to you by Ford, featuring available Sync with My Ford Touch. Sync with My Ford Touch gets you to your destination with integrated turn-by-turn -turn directions and directional arrows displayed on screen. Check it out on the 2012 Ford Focus and at Ford.com slash technology and by netflix watch thousands of tv episodes and movies on your pc mac ipad iphone or tv instantly all stream directly to you saving you time money and hassle for your free 30-day trial go to netflix.com slash twit it's time for triangulation a fun show in which tom merritt and i put someone in the middle and quiz them usually a person of interest somebody who has something to say so I've worked in all the potential titles for this <laughs> show. Brainstorming titles, can you tell? <laughs> <laughs> Here's Tom Merritt. And that man in the middle is actually uh, a guy we were interviewing on Triangulation a couple of months ago. Uh, in the middle of the interview, Steve, word came that Steve Jobs had passed away. And actually, Kevin very kindly stuck around and uh, joined our coverage uh, that night. But we didn't really get to talk to you, Kevin, about your history. So it's good to get you back. Kevin Marks, welcome. Thank you. Great to be here again. Are we going to include the first part of that episode as a bonus track? We should. This one? We should. We you should. Know, that's a great idea, yeah. actually. Um, Kevin uh, has a very interesting checkered past. He's been on many of our shows because of that checkered past, because of all the things uh, he's done. But uh, it also... sounds like a killer or something. It's well, he is a person <laughs> of interest. We just don't know what he's... He's done something. We just don't know what it is. Um, he was at Technorati. He's been at Apple. He has been uh, at uh, British... Uh, telecom. Uh, he is currently at Salesforce, uh, but it all started at the BBC. Is that right, Kevin? Um, I, BBC is the first place I went to work um, when I left university, yes. And I was actually a video engineer initially, um, working uh, on mobile recording audio and video stuff, uh, repairing devices and um, getting stuff together. But then I, I joined this group called the Interactive Television Unit. Um, which was, there was originally a thing on the BBC called the Doomsday Project, and if you don't know if you remember this, it's, this was in 1986, the, um, the um, 900th anniversary of the Doomsday Book, they decided to um, come up with this idea of a project where they'd gather information from all over Britain and produce a computer version of it. Um, so they had this sort of ridiculously ahead of its time system, which was um, a BBC Micro attached to a Philips laser vision player, which had a SCSI interface, um, so you could get data out of the laser disc as well as, uh, as video and audio. And so they built this sort of weird multimedia encyclopedia thing that was required this magic hardware, which they made a, you know, a few thousand of them, gave them out to schools and libraries. So this is this sort of huge public service project. And when that finished in 86, this group was left at the BBC wondering what to do next. That was the interactive television unit. And they were messing around at the edges of computers. There we go, there's a oh, impressive piece of discovery. There. Messing around <laughs> um, with computers and video and trying to make the two fit together um, at the time where it wasn't quite possible to do much with it. Look at the size of CDs in those days. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's, the, that's the laser disc, yeah. Good old laser disc. They were yeah. ginormous back then. Yeah. Um, so yeah, this was pre just pre CD because CDs did were around I think in eighty six. There were CDs and CD ROMs were just starting actually. In in, um, in one of the things that, that I w first worked on there was translating one of their their discs from um, that was called EcoDisc, which was a uh, it was like they took a camera to a nature reserve and walked around the nature reserve and took photographs in all directions. So it was kind of like Street View. You could walk around this na nature reserve and turn around and look in different directions. Is, there a, is that a cartridge in that thing? No, no. Where? where? So, uh, sorry. Go back a go back a little bit on that because the keyboard. What is that? Is that that the, AIV thing sticking that, out? There. Oh, the, yeah. That's a the, that's a slot you can yeah you can stick things in. That was like a ROM expansion. Thing. <laughs> that's where you put the base invaders. <laughs> Look at this. I mean, but this, this is the BBC Micro. This is a six five zero two processor. Oh, this, that was the this Micro. Is an, this is a you know the original sort of again BBC decided to get into computing and they they right. got Acorn to build this thing and promoted it to schools. So this is I this remember is, that very well. Yeah. 
In fact, between, it, it, between, it, between the Sinclair the and, the, and, the, and, the, and the BBC Micro, there, there were, and the Acorn, there were a lot of people in, in Britain, at least, who cut their teeth on these on these uh, inexpensive computers. Yeah, I started out with the Commodore Pet. I was. Um, We've got one of those next time you're here. Micro. Next time you're here, we'll show you our pet. <laughs> or just Look watch TNT. It's behind IAS every day. <laughs> That's right. Um, so you were when you say video engineer, then it was all about for you. It was about uh, it was electronics. It was analog signals. Um, it was just yeah. There wasn't much digital going on at that point. There, you know, there were there were um, paint boxes and things like that. Another group at the BBC that I um, nearly worked at was the computer graphics workshop. Um, but when I went to interview them. Um, they, they basically most of their funding came from doing election graphics, which was every five years. Right. Um, and they were saying, yes, we're all revved up for the next election. And this was, this was 88, and the next election didn't happen until 91. So I would have spent three years working on graphics for one night. Not a lot to which do. Is, yeah. Well, no, they, they did, you know, they did the weather graphics and other things as well, but that was their big thing. And I was like, wow. nah, nah. And they had this really weird system. They had, like, um, the, the Quantel paint boxes, which were right. these... Um, visual effects units that were actually, the word digital worked in a really weird way. Um, they basically worked by having the video picture in RAM and then changing the addressing of the RAM to warp the picture. Oh my goodness. Um, and they used the raster scan of the TV to refresh the RAM as well. It was, it was this like amazing, wow. you know, hodgepodge. And they had, they had an API to that that was private that nobody else had. Um, and then they had some external Macs that you would write this Pascal to control the Quantel paint box to do the graphics. So he was like, you know, that was that was what you had to do to do TV quality graphics in those days. Right. So that was that 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 group. And I didn't end up going to work with that group because because of that. I went to this other group that was doing this sort of weird, not quite TV, not quite video stuff. Um, and then shortly you, after that, sorry, you had the, the pet before this though. So you were you were aware pet, of digital technology yeah. and computers and the potential of computers. What yeah, kind no, of I things think, did I you do on your pet? Um, what's what I do with the pet? Initial, well, the pet, if you remember, the, the pet only had character graphics. It didn't right. have a mm -hmm. bitmap graphic. Right. One of the things I did, I had some friends at the computer club who were hardware hackers, um, and they built um, a thing that would let you put RAM where the character chip was so we could modify the characters there. Hmm. So I end up doing um, software for that that let you edit the, the characters and produce um, non-character graphics on the screen. So, and, and so you were an that. early hacker then. So, so I was hacking with that stuff. Yeah. Oh, what else did I do with that? I built an, um, a D2A converter so I could do digital music on it, and there was some software you could... Basically, the, the, the pet didn't have audio output. Um, there were two ways you could get audio out. One was um, you could put a... There was, a, there was a, like a serial bit you could attach to it, and it, you, could, you would get a square wave out of that, and that was how you did sound. Um, but they also had a parallel port that was 8-bit, and so if you put power of two resistors across that and connect that to a signal, you can, and then change the data on the, of the parallel port quickly enough, you can get audio out. Huh. So I, I built one of those, um, did, had some software to do audio generation stuff with that. So I was playing around with the hardware side as well as the software side, even back then. But that was, yeah, that was 10 years before. Um, well, eight years before, it was like 1980 or so. Mm. Um, and so the bit, the, the, so the, this group, the BBC, um, was still trying to work out, you know, what what this what this was. The stuff they'd done Doomsday with was, you know, insane. It was a a, a vax that they'd used to store the data on. It was their, their mainframe wow. stuff. That, um, and in at, at the turn in 1990, the um, that group spun out from the BBC as a separate company um, called uh, Multimedia Corporation, with the goal of doing whatever it was at this sort of junction of video and computing, but as a commercial organization, not as a, um, not as a sort of state-funded one like the BBC was at the time. And I went with them then. Um, and that, uh, that was where we were sort of experimenting with actually having computers that could display the, you know, get at the pixels rather than just take a video signal and route it through to the screen. So the first batch of that was all done with overlay guards, um, where you t you'd have the external video under control and you you'd overlay something on it. Um, and then later, we you know we, we gradually got to do to do actual digital video um, and stuff like that as well. So making it started out um, doing quite a few things that were like uh, museum installations where we could get you know install three big projectors and video displayers, synchronize them with a the serial control, and have a touch screen to manipulate them and do stuff like that. 
um, and then in parallel doing some CD-ROM stuff for the sort of early CD-ROM platforms that were around there. Well, and how did this end up? I mean, museum is a good example of one way this ends up uh, out in the public. Is what kinds of CD-ROM stuff were people able to take advantage of? Because this is early, early days of CD-ROM. Um, yeah, it's well, um, Apple had started shipping CD-ROM drives um, as as an external peripheral. They, were, they weren't built into machines yet, so there was an external device that was you know sort of that big that you would plug into plug into the computer over the SCSI port and then you had to hook the audio up separately the audio didn't come through the computer so you'd have you have this sort of gear that you had to plug into it um, and you couldn't um, you couldn't if you were playing CD audio you couldn't read data so if you wanted to use the, the actual audio on the CD you couldn't read data at the same time so you had to choose between the two so there were things do you remember the um, Beethoven's ninth CD-ROM thing Leo might remember this yeah Wait a minute, that's coming back to me. You know, I did a, it's funny, in the early 90s, I did a show, I did a segment, a regular weekly segment on a public broadcasting show in which I would review CD-ROM titles. <laughs> At the time, everybody thought, this is the future of publishing. Yeah. And no, there were was, museum was. tours. Uh, was it, who did the, who did the, uh, the Beethoven's uh, fifth, uh, was, oh, it, God, was it a Beethoven. criterion or something? Anyway... Um, Voyager. Voyager. Um, Voyager. So Voyager was was early on in this thing. Bob um, Bob Stein. Well, and they we did a lot of laser discs yeah. as well. They did some amazing yes. stuff, interactive. And the web killed all this stuff because it was you don't need well, it anymore. South by Southwest Interactive began a yes. South by Southwest CDs. multimedia, yep. which was all, yep. all about yeah. CD ROMs. Isn't that yeah. funny? And then they made the same jump. They said, "Oh, wait a minute, the web is where." I'm you guys are too young to sound like old farts, but you are. I got to tell you. <laughs> Well, that's, you know, this is the, so the, the, the CD-ROM thing, um, so it started out as external devices, and then they got built into the, um, the computers with the, um, you know, the, the, the later models. Um, but these, the, these were things that people were, were, were buying for, you know, 50, 70 bucks. They, were, they cost quite a bit in those days, um, and there was a market for them. But also what we found was that there was a market um, for the companies who were making these. They wanted to bundle some with a device, and if you could get in on that deal, then that was that was you know, more guaranteed income, even though they would pay less per, per unit for it. Um, so we did, we did a bunch of, we, we, there was a, do you, do you remember the 3DO? Oh, yeah. yeah, I loved the 3DO. So the 3DO I had a 3DO, was, I loved that. It was a game machine. Well, Trip Hawkins, that was his, uh, yeah. that was his company. Now, of course, he went on to EA, but. Um, well, it was, it was owned by EA or, or. I think, it was, well, anyway, yeah. Trip. Yeah, at the, at the point we were dealing with them in, in the, the mid-90s, it was, it was owned by EA and, okay. and Trip was there. Um, and or or was it that EA was publishing for this, but through some sort of you know backhanded deal? Um, anyway, EA said we, we're launching this 3DO thing. We need some stuff. We need the games, but we also need some educational titles because this educational thing is is one of the ways where we get people to spend so much money on a device. <laughs> um, so you've done these great you know, museum things. Um, one of the things we did in the museum was called Erdzicht, which was. Um, simulated flyovers of the globe with our environmental stories. So you'd, be, oh, you'd, you'd see this flyover and then you'd hit an icon, it would fly down and tell you a story and then fly back up again. Google so Earth layers very, long before Google Earth, right? <laughs> there's, there's, a, no, there's a story I'll get to in a bit there, yeah. Right. But so we did this, so we, said, we pitched them this idea of 3D atlas of, okay, you want educational titles, you could, somebody make you an encyclopedia, we'll make you an atlas and we'll build you the whole globe that you can turn and zoom and then when you zoom in, you will have um, video and audio stories and things that, that tell you about the places you're looking at. Um, and they they were keen on this for 3DO, but we also did a Mac version because we you know, we all had Macs and Mac um, had a decent install base of CD-ROM drives in the, this was like 92, 93 when we started this uh, this one. Um, and that was, that was the sort of the breakout CD-ROM product that worked for us in that um, we decided to actually make it um, actually software and not just storytelling, if you see what I mean. Most of the CD-ROM stuff was, was saying, um, okay, we're TV producers, we're going to try and pretend we can do TV in this, um, even though the video is like this big. Um, and it, it didn't quite work. There, there wasn't a, a sense of an application to it. Whereas we built it actually as a, a Mac app and then the, the 3DO version with the idea that you could turn the globe anywhere um, and zoom in and out and you know, measure things and have to do some kinds of, of mapping stuff with it. <laughs> wow, that's, that's an ancient rendering. You could thank that's, Chad for all of this. He's fast on the draw. He's very impressive. Yeah. This is, this is one of the... the this is a yeah. 3DO type. This is the 3DO version, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So we had... We had um, 
I could tell because of the crappy globe, graphics. A physical globe, a physical grove, and a... It, it was only 320, Yeah, but you know what? For, for its that. time, it was pretty amazing. Yeah, those... Uh, the, you know, seeing pictures look like yeah. pictures at the time yeah. was impressive. Yeah, so we could turn the globe in all directions. Let's actually give the demo for me. Zoom in and out, um, uh, overlay countries and just stuff like that. Um, and... And then there were stories there, and then we had a, ga a quiz game thing of like, you know, can you, you know, can you match the country with the flag and stuff like that. And were you in software at this point, or were you still working? Yeah. 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 So this was this was a multimedia corporation. We were building this. Right. Um, and what were you? We, what were you writing it? In? I mean, it's not HyperCard or something. What was, was, this was at this point. This was writing stuff in C. Yeah. We had to. We had to. You had to code it from the ground up. Yeah. And we did the same for the Mac version. We coded that in C as well, which made it was much more responsive than, than building it in Director or any of these other sort of layered environments. Right. Um, and, and we built our own, you know, at this point, we'd, we had, at this point, oh, wait, they can show the stats. Oh, the yeah, stats were so much fun. This, this, I, I wrote this. I, I love this. This was, <laughs> um, we took all the data from the World Resource Institute, and which was like several thousand different kinds of um, statistics and then overlay them on the globe and let you color the globe with them um and then we'd we'd also had um we had like lots of different views we would let you combine two stats so that you could actually do one over the other or something like oh, that keep a bunch of other stuff um we also would do um a time series of the, the stuff changing over time um, and used the, used each country's flag as the data point, so you could see as as stuff moved. So you could. They, they, well, I had a lot of fun building this out of this sort of ridiculously low risk thing. In 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 hindsight, you know, I mean, this looks kind of simple and trivial, and yet you got to remember what a huge deal this was at the time. I mean, it, uh, these kinds of visualizations, you couldn't. Uh, this yeah, device used to seven hundred bucks. These satellite map, you know, yeah, high resolution. Yeah, but this is pre Google, pre Google yeah. Earth. I mean, this this is pretty impressive yeah. stuff. Well, we, we had, we did have, we did use satellite imagery. We worked with um, University College London, um, which was a, a research university there that did the satellite imagery. So they would, they would um, get the satellite imagery and reconstruct these, these kinds of flights for us and also um, construct the, 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 the whole globe. Um, and then the, I think this one will like zoom in and then it overlays a, a higher res satellite image and shows you some detail there as well. Yeah, so nice. there was a bunch of, Brilliant. there was some stuff like this that were sort of pre-rendered ones. But there were whole globes with varying levels of zoom that we could show things, and we had some cities that were in higher res. Um, that we basically treated as flat. Year, what year was this? Uh, ninety three, ninety. Ninety. I think it was ninety three, ninety four. Yeah. Yeah. So I mean, think about that compared to what you're you're used to now on the web. I mean, this is pretty darn close all the way back right. then. Yeah. At right. a time when, like most most of the CD ROMs and multimedia stuff that I remember had a, had maybe a little postage stamp type picture right. it was sort of bitmap looking and yeah. I, want, I want to jump forward a little was, bit so that was one of the things we did on the on the mac was that we decided we would use uh 16 bit graphics instead uh -huh. of 8 bit graphics uh -huh. there um, you go. because all the macs that were launching were coming out with 16 bit graphics right. um which meant that we could that actually 16 -bit have color or yeah. re resolution so, 16 bit color color yeah. okay it was still it was still 64480 or, or less 512 384 resolution but um the the, the graphics um, because they actually had 16-bit graphics, it meant we could do video that looked better, um, and we could build a user interface that had um, a, a more style to it. Could use gradients, could do subtle stuff because you weren't always worrying about um, pixels. Um, and then when we did that, that was a huge hit with Apple, and Apple were then very keen to bundle this because it showed off the graphics for the title. Whereas most every other title was focused on you know 8-bit at most, you know, or less. You know, the, 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 this was you know. Just about Windows Windows three time, and the the PCs um, had you know eight bit or four, or four bit graphics if you wanted that many pixels. They, you they, know, they it's interesting many. because the, it, did Cyber Nations come out of this, or is this just something you've always been interested in? Um, I've what the the geography stuff? Yeah, I mean the cyber you know, the Cyber Nations game. Did this come? So, I, you I don't know what you mean. Sorry. There's a. It says there's a massively multiplayer game invented by Kevin Marks. Maybe it's a different Kevin Marks. Ah. In, Are you the creator of Cyber Nations, an I've online nation simulation game? You haven't. 
Yeah. Your Wikipedia, Wikipedia be says so wrong. I, my Wikipedia says what? I'm afraid you're mistaken, Kevin. Wikipedia says you do <laughs> know about cybernation. Uh, well, what's interesting, because this, uh, it sounds like something you would have been interested It says, created by Kevin Mark's model in the game he invented as a child involving a world map and pushpins. It sounded like you've been doing this stuff since you were a kid. This is weird. Okay, I should, I should read this. This, this is fascinating. <laughs> Not that Kevin Marks, apparently. That's probably what it is. Although it's linked right out of your uh, Wikipedia yeah, page. So, so, yeah, okay. If someone wants to fix that, that's cool, because it's not me. Okay. We'll fix that. <laughs> uh, <laughs> not me, although I could see why somebody would be confused, because it's very similar to uh, the kind of stuff. Yeah. When did you, so when did you go to work for Apple? Was that right out of this? So what happened was um, we, we, we built these CD-ROM things. Um, the 3 Dots one was enormously successful. Some of the other ones were... Um, yeah, that suddenly went, oh, we should do more of these things. But it was, it was actually quite hard to do um, something of that scope. We did some encyclopedic ones, we did some other ones based on um, books that we were trying to do the same kind of thing to. But this was coming up to the time when the web was gaining in importance. Right. So by, you know, 1996, 97, it was fairly clear to those of us who were, like, on the technical side that the web was, was going to take this, this thing over. But we had these year-long contracts to make these CD-ROMs, that were, you know, it was, it was a, they were million-dollar projects, they were, and they would take about a year, and you had to hit yes. the, the shipping window. And they'd sell like, 50 copies. I mean, the whole thing just collapsed. Well, we, we, did, we did better, you know, we were doing better than that because we had these bundle deals and we had these, right. these things. But there was a presumption that the others would do as well as 3D Atlas, which was a, a bit... That was the uh, one. An assumption. Yeah, that was um, the one. Ended up being your peak. Yeah. Um, well, we had, we had some follow-ups that, that did well, too. But, mm -hmm. but the other thing was that, you know, we were also on this sort of... Um, classic game royalty type contract with EA, where um, they had first dibs on any sequels, and they wow. we only got they would reinvest the um, the recoupment into the next thing. So I learned a lot about annoying industry contracts from that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, we all have to Thanks. learn sometime. <laughs> Better to learn um, early than late. But but yeah, no. What what was what was happening was was that the you know. The web was catching up with what what these things were able to do, and that, right. and eventually, like Christmas '96, it was fairly clear that actually the web was what mattered and what these weren't. And suddenly, this this wasn't viable anymore. And so we <coughs> we tried, you know, we we changed what we were doing. The company we're doing more web work and and so on. But the production skills that we had were were focused on these sort of very high production value video things, um, the native code engineering, that kind of stuff. Um, and it wasn't really a great fit for building like 1996 era websites where if you had an animated GIF, you were doing well in the, in the, <laughs> the visual side. You know? Under and construction. You down, yeah. And you were back down to 8 bit and web safe yeah, palette, yeah. all that stuff again. Um, so that, you know, that was um, one of those like technology transitions that's really hard to deal with. And this company didn't deal with it very well. Um, because they were, you know, they were hooked on these expensive big productions. They, we weren't quite geared up to do many shorter um, web-style productions. Um, and we'd, at this point, we'd, um, we'd gone public, and we ended up with some bankers who ended up in control of the company. Oh. And decided they'd rather shut it down and use our previous losses to fund something else than, than keep oh, it going. That's so, really sad. So, so yeah, that was that was that was very sad. So we went from, you know. 50 of us down to, you know, I was the last one there trying to tidy up the last few hungover CD projects that were still there. So that was, that was, that was very sad. Mm. Um, and from, from that, I went um, over these like um, eight, eight uh, seven or eight years, we've been working with Apple um, and working with the QuickTime team to integrate video into our applications. And we were, we were, you know, they knew us fairly well because we were always trying to do things that we couldn't quite do yet. Um, and so I talked to the... <laughs> you heard the guy calling saying, you know, if it could only... <laughs> they were going, saying, yeah, there he is again. <laughs> but, you know... It, it, no, that's it, good. It, I think that's good. how products improve, is the users, yeah. uh, especially great users like I'm sure you were, uh, help, uh, say, drive the drive the product and a good company. Well, but also there was the, the QuickTime dev mailing list, which was right. um, where the QuickTime engineers and, and the developers talked to each other. Boy, and I was, that seems like the kind of thing that you wouldn't see anymore at Apple. Um, it's it's rarer now, but, you know, that, that was, you know, this was, I mean, we didn't have, you know, this was, the, the web was barely there, you know, we had Apple right. Link. Um, right. But we had a mailing list that, that we could discuss this, discuss stuff on and I was on there telling people how to do things so I always found odd ways to do things that didn't quite work or whatever um, so and I'd go to Apple developer conferences every year and 
and, and, visit, and you know, visit them and show them our stuff and talk right. about it. Yeah. So the QuickTime guy said, oh, you, you're looking around for work, come, come interview with us. So awesome. um, I came over about this time of year, it was Thanksgiving 90, Thanksgiving 97 it was, um, and came over and met them. And it was weird because it was, it was one of the first times I had those experience, you know, they have that experience where you've been talking to someone online, then you meet them face to face. Um, and the interviews were like that because suddenly it was like, oh, you're that yeah. guy on the list. Yeah, right. Ah, oh, I know what you, I know right. what you know. Okay, let me right. ask you this. You're it, sort it of that, famous to me. I know who you are. Right. Well, it was, you know, it was, I'd, I'd, I'd somehow made friends with a bunch of guys you know, 8,000 miles away in a different time zone, mm -hmm. um, so, you know, some of which I met face to face. You know, I'm exaggerating a little bit, but there were a chunk of people there. It's like, oh, you're that you, you're that name from the main list who does, doesn't normally get up on stage at developer conference, but right. I know you, you know me. Right. Right. So I'd, I'd somehow, you know, managed to make a connection over the net. And so that I, they said, come, come to California, work for Apple. And so it was like, yeah, that sounds like a great sure. idea. We sure. did. I'll be right there. Had two little kids, had a one year old and a three year old Ooh. ourselves moved over here but that's quite a bold move so uh what did you do what were your responsibilities on that team uh, so in quick time um it was it was kind of odd because they they hired me this at this time of year but we had to wait for the visa so when i actually came over the next april um a bunch of things had changed uh you know, steve jobs had come back from taking right. over a that was, that was a change a big um, change yeah they'd actually just shipped quick time three so the week i turned up most of the team was wasn't there. There were there were only a few of them there, which was kind of odd. They're like, oh yeah, you're the new guy. Here's your office. Um, everyone everyone's just taken <laughs> two weeks right off. Now. Let's be shipped. You know. <laughs> so that was that was kind of weird. But the the first thing I worked on was the um, the app that was the the DVD player app. So this was when Apple was just starting to put DVDs in the machines. Mm -hmm. um, and it, you know, it's the irony. It was like at that time they weren't going through the digital stuff, they had a, their own separate channel and were doing overlays onto the, the screen. So it was like being in a video disc land again. Mm -hmm. It was like, you couldn't actually get at the pixels of the thing. Um, they had a special decoding hardware. And there was a bunch of you know, stuff to work on with that. So I, I ended up working on that app and doing some bits and pieces on that. Um, and then um, I came back to my desk one day and, and um, there was a marker pen scroll on my screen saying, come and find me, Peter. <laughs> um, and this was Peter Hoddy, who was the, the chief engineer of the QuickTime team. Um, and he said, I went to see him, and he said, oh, okay, we've got the developer conference coming up in a week, um, and we want to show off our, our new uh, streaming video stuff. But when we showed it to Steve, um, he said, what, what do you mean you can't capture video and do it live? You can only do pre-recorded stuff. We need to do something live. So we need to build a demo showing that we can, we can um, do live video capture and... Well, I nominate you to help us do this. <laughs> okay. Okay. So I, the, the streaming team had been working for two years building the, this, 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 this nice solid standards-based streaming stuff, um, a streaming server and the, the client software. It was a, it was a, you know, one of the, it was one of those um, times where Apple went with the standardized um, route. So what was, what, what was the standard at the time? Was it HTTP streaming or was it? No, it was, it was RTP, real-time RTP streaming. RTP. So this was, um, if you remember CUC Me. Yes. Uh, yep. It was also the standard for used for doing um, video video telephony, audio telephony as well. So it's it's UDP based. It's not TCP based. Okay. Is it, is it an H dot like an H dot three two four or three two three or? Um, those specify different levels of of codecs. Um, so some of them. Some, so there was H two six three was one of the codecs that was there, but um, two six four didn't exist yet. I see. There was H. Um, but well, it was we don't need to know the exact standard. But it was standard. It, 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 there was basically there were interchangeable codecs and it, right. for audio and video, um, and then there were rules for how you churn data into packets and, and put them into packets on the wire, um, and each packet was designed to be individually losable without causing um, loss, cascade losses. In effect, right. like UDP works, right? Yeah, it was, it was UDP. It was it, RTP is UDP with an extra header. Gotcha. Um, so each audio and video packet was sent out as a separate packet. And you you didn't try and retransmit generally, because the assumption was your latency was low enough. Um, you, was, can, you can miss a you'll packet make it here or there. Yeah, yeah. And and also the the assumption was that it wasn't that compressed, so each packet was only twenty milliseconds, so you could just repeat the previous one, and you, the audio doesn't sound too bad. Um, and then the the thing that the QuickTime guys had done and said, okay, actually doing this in real time um, is kind of hard, but um, 
if we if we allow the if we if we assume we're only doing one way streaming most of the time if we're doing something that is like watching um watching a show where you're not interacting so like the the audience is watching us now that streaming has a buffer in it right um or if you're if you're watching a movie playback or something like that over the over the network then we can afford to put a bit of more buffer on the client if you put a three second buffer there we can actually cope with anything we can we can um by relaxing that latency constraint a bit we can actually have some codecs that aren't actually tuned for this and make them work too so that they, they did that so they had this whole system built but job said but if you can't do live transmission this is you know this is this is pointless build the, build the live transition thing do so you, th you think he was right about that i know it was uh, harder to do it was he was it's interesting he was right he was definitely right in terms of the demo because we, we, we built the demo and the demo was great there's you know it's up on the net somewhere um so it's um but what but so what i had to do was i had to hook up the video capture software to the um, encoding and packaging bit they already had, which they'd done for offline, um, and just create a stream that then the ordinary client could play. So we had this sort of magic transmitter that would create something that the, the clients can play. And then oh, that worked. That was uh, um, that was demoed at the, was it the 97 developer conference? The 98 developer conference? This is 97 developer conference. Um, and then was I was, that QuickTime streaming server? Was that what they called it at the time? And no, this was Quick, QuickTime Broadcaster. Was Broadcaster? Okay. Well, this, this wasn't actually QuickTime. This was a, ha a, a grotesque hack. Um, and then QuickTime Broadcaster <laughs> was what I then worked on. It was the, the predecessor to the actual program. Now that yeah. you've demoed it, build it. <laughs> now that we've demoed this, can you actually make this? Okay, now we've designed system software for this and an app, blah blah blah. Right, right. But they and still. So they, I don't know. If many people use it. But they still ship it on on Apple uh, on Macintosh server, right? Yeah, no, I mean this is this is one of these things. This was one of those weird things where um, that assumption that they said, well, if we had a three second buffer, we can make this better, was one of those weird things where, and then you start doing retransmission, and then you suddenly find you've reinvented TCP, and actually you should be using TCP for this. <laughs> oh rats! Um, <laughs> because I hate it when that happens. <laughs> it was, it was, it, you know, we, we built this product that let you do, you know, live broadcasting from from your Mac anywhere. Right. You know, I, um, and that there weren't that many applications for it. We had this sort of weird thing where we built this thing. What use is it? And the thing is that a lot of the use of, of the kind of thing we're doing now is having a um, some kind of back channel and conversations. So there's something else going on too. That's so why like, you would want to do it live. If you want to do it live, you you need the chat room there to to, to give right. you feedback and talk to them. Right. Um, you, you need you need that kind of stuff going on. And if you look at the successful. Um, st streaming things now, like Quick and those ones, they will have that. They will have that idea it's of... It's built in. I've said this, but yeah. I've got a channel. Yeah. Uh, and that was... So we we built this, and it was like, well, what is this actually good for? Um, the sort of the streaming server part was kind of made some sense, but actually using a web server was better. Um, it, it, it actually performed better. Um, and then... The, really? Now, wow, that's interesting. It performed... Which would be HTTP streaming. Yeah, well, performed it's, better. This, this is um, this is this was a huge fight at the time. So one of the things I I did there was, um, we, we you know QuickTime had fast start video playback since um, before I got there since early nineties. Right. Which Love was basically that. you'd start a download, open. but it would be able to play immediately. Yeah, and that was would, HTTP based. Yes, it would. It was HTTP one based. It would start downloading the file. Um, it would look at how much it had got and how much it had left to go and estimate if you could download it or not and then start playing through right um and we you know we built we, we they built their side so i helped tune bits of it as well but that was something that'd been there for a long time um but this was on the presumption that you don't random access you only just pull from the beginning and keep downloading because http one didn't have random access mm -hmm. um whereas you have http 1.1 that was when they said oh you can read this bit from the middle of the file so you could actually skip back and forth um and that was the one of the features. And there's the problem. And this is UDP failing. Oh, the UDP. And <laughs> we just dropped you for a second. You're back. <laughs> Actually, that's a Wi-Fi <laughs> issue. <laughs> Should have used UDP. <laughs> Too many packets. Too many packets. Yeah. Um, so, one of the things I hacked on there was. Um, well, th 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 this suddenly became obvious, and talked to my, my my friend Stuart Cheshire at Apple there, who was a networking guy. Was like, well, you know, TCP is just a file stream. You, it doesn't. There's nothing that says you have to do it that way. You can you can you can seek inside that, and it will work. And we, um, and if you mounted a 
you know, a server over WebDAV, you were effectively doing that and the stuff would play off it. So I did it, I wrote a data handler that, that just used HTTP as the transport uh, and looked like a, a file system and we built that and that worked. Oh. Um, and that was, um, the reason we built that demo was for um, the iTunes playback. When, we, when, not, when iTunes could, could playback the, the stuff nearby, how should it do that, right? And the, the group that had built the streaming service says, oh, we need a, you need a streaming service to do that. We can do it with this infrastructure. Um, and Stuart and I were like, well, well, oh, no, you can just play the files off the other machine. Um, and so the, the demo that, that, you know, the open the lid and the, um, Stuart was working on Bonjour, the, the um, let you find nearby computer stuff. So the, oh, I opened the lid of this laptop and suddenly my, mach my machine appears in iTunes, I can play the music off that. Um, that was that was what we had together to demo that that was in that was a few years later but that was you know that was suddenly realizing that actually treating the web as a file system worked better than um pretending that something that was real time wasn't mm. you see what I mean? um so the the original video protocol for for streaming was designed for a two way conversation like skype like like this kind of chat we're having now with the assumption that latency is paramount because if you have more than a few hundred milliseconds of latency when you're talking to somebody, the conversation breaks up. Right. You, you start having to sort of say over, you can't interrupt, you can't, you know. Right. So was it a choice up. between file seeking and latency? Yeah. So it's a question of what are you optimizing for? And the problem was, the problem is that um, the TV companies were used to a, a, a low latency world. Um, because when television was invented, there wasn't enough RAM in the world to buffer a, a video image. <laughs> right. 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 Um, so th the assumption was always, oh, we are sending a signal out um, and not, no one's buffering, they're just watching it. And this was getting less and less true. Um, but their mindset was still, oh, we're, live, oh, we're sending a live stream out. We had, we had right. a series of channels. And so what we ended up modeling was, was that, that worldview where right. we put the streaming system that would do that. Whereas what was actually valuable was turning those things into files, you know, um, so that you have access to it. So you have a Netflix type situation or a YouTube type situation where um, you, you don't all have to watch the same thing at the same time. Mm -hmm. um, so there was this, and you know, and eventually, you know, the, the iTunes was the you know, realization of that as well. In effect, iTunes was, oh, um, we should sell sell songs and later videos as standalone files that people can choose to you know, to play as a whole. Um, but this sort of combination of this, oh. Telephony is real time and television is real time, so we should use the same kind of model for both. Mm -hmm. um, and therefore, we should model the video and audio transmission on the computer um, as if it was telephony, had, had low buffering. It took a long time to, to realize that this was actually a bad idea. And having built a chunk of it and, and, and done this, it was like, uh, actually, this streaming server is not that useful compared to a web server. Um, because you, the, the, the thing is, you always. Um, you always want to have as if if you if the thing at the other end is fixed, you want as big a buffer as possible, and the biggest buffer that's possible is download the whole file. Right. Um, and then what you know if you don't have enough space left to hold the file, you want at least enough that you can have a sort of blip in um, network connectivity and not get a, a blip in in playback. Right. Um, and that is you know, this is this is, the weird part is this debate is still going on now. You know, um, ten years later, there's uh, was it the ITF. Um, at the ITF, the W3C um, video group, and they, we're still talking about um, adaptive streaming and stuff like that, and saying, oh, we need adaptive streaming. It's like, why do you need adaptive streaming? Um, so we can switch the quality on the fly when the network connection goes out. It's like, well, you only need that if you're not buffering enough. Um, why are you not buffering enough? You know, back, or, back in or if you want to be low latency live. If you want to be low latency live, okay, fair. Low la if you want to be low latency live, or, you know, or even medium latency live, you know, you can still use... You, can, you don't have to do something that's, that's too clever if you're just watching something like, like Twit uh, because you, you, there's still 10, 15 seconds of delay right. um, on, the, on the way out, and that's enough to... That's close to enough for a chat room to work. Right. Yeah. Not to have a conversation, but for a chat room to work. Yeah, exactly. Right. Yeah. It, it's a question of what the, what, what the perceived lag is. Although it's ruined the ability to watch something and then turn down the sound and listen to something else. You can, nothing sucks <laughs> anymore. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Well, that's it. Oh, the, 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 the number of years of my life I lost a bloody sink, I tell you. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> we just wish we had Genlock. That's all. We just want Genlock. <laughs> well, no, the, the, but this, this, this point about buffering is, is, is what I was saying, is that before nothing, you know, you couldn't buffer, so you couldn't lose sync, right? Right. 
Whereas then we became able to buffer audio, so therefore we could delay the audio and not the video. But now every video frame you look at has been buffered at least three times because um, even on the TV, the the display is a buffer that that it's going that it's going to from that. So there's there's at least a one frame delay there. Um, and if you're doing MPEG decoding, um, they send this, the the frames out of sequence. So you need to have at least really. Um, they send keyframes and then they send. You send a keyframe. You have keyframes. You have prediction frames. You have bidirectional prediction frames. So you have a keyframe and a keyframe. Keyframe right. and keyframe. In the middle here, you have an intermediate frame right. that's protected from the keyframe. Right. And then in here, you have bidirectional frames that go between those two. And they don't arrive in order. So you have to send the keyframe, the B frame, and the, sorry, the keyframe, the P frame, and then the, the, the B frames in between. Right. So you need to have you at least whatever order. spacing between that wow. delay to decode the MPEG. Right. Um, which is why when you switch channels on a digital cable box, a there's a gap. For it, yeah, it, it can show you anything. Wow, again. I had no idea that's no, what's, is that, is that that was it because it's interpreting those B frames in between, right? Yeah, and if you just if you just show the B frames, you get weird pixel noise. Yeah, because 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 it's trying to interpret. It's yeah, trying to do. What's you, you sometimes see that when you come into the middle of a stream, you see like someone's face texture mapping out of out of a gray background. Oh, you step like in that. all the time on digital cable. Right, they've got to yeah. they've got down a little bit. Yeah, they buffer probably. They, they, they buffer a bit more. Yeah, what they do now is they'll, they'll, buff, they'll buffer before you switch. But right. anyway, the, the point is, you will. Um, the, there was there's still this thing of oh, this is this is the way you do it, and we've gradually moved to a file-based world where actually you you do it. Um, if you're watching something that has been pre-recorded, there's there's absolutely no reason for you to watch it live. Right. The, the but the interesting thing I'm seeing now is that so then you store and forward. They do everything. Yeah. Download. Yeah. Yeah, or you, or, or even you know, if you just treat the thing as a file server and, and pull it over the network in big chunks rather than in, right. in fractions of a second chunk. Got it. But I know people but, resist that sometimes because they don't, like, they think it's more bandwidth intensive to do that. It's exactly the same amount of bandwidth, right? It's precisely yeah, it's, the same number of bits. <laughs> it's just, um, well, the, what they the, worry about is that that somebody stops watching and then they've, oh, they've, they've spent they've a lot of time more yeah. buffering they, a bunch they would of stuff that they're not going to okay. watch. Yeah, but, right. this, but that's a Yes and no. I mean, the, the thing is, it's, it's trading off bandwidth versus latency all the time. And the, the thing that you want is to have, have an interrupt-free experience. So, you know, the, the right answer would be for, for to do it on a chapter-by-chapter -chapter basis, right? Right. Um, so it, then you it, only it, download a chapter. Yeah. Uh, you never more than a chapter uh, yeah. access. Unlike, unlike everything apart from this show, um, is, is, or, you know, all things very like this show, actually have meaningful chunks and stops in them. I suppose this show does too, because we love... We love well, it's going to, unfortunately, we're not even caught up. We're not even <laughs> a quarter of the way through your career, uh, and we have to stop now. Ah! <laughs> We've reached the end of our buffer. <laughs> our buffer is overflowed. I wanted to ask you how Flash did this. Yeah. I wanted to ask you about Technorati. <laughs> he invented <laughs> podcasting. Adam Curry finally admitted that. Uh, <laughs> and, and then we didn't even get to the modern era and standards, microformats, British Telecom, J.P. Rangaswamy, and, and Salesforce.com. And so we're going to have to get you back another time. How about that? <laughs> okay, we can do that. I just love talking to Kevin, and it gets sometimes a little abstruse. I hope we didn't get, get you too abstruse. We didn't even get to the commercial. So let me just mention, before we let him go, uh, the, <laughs> the folks at Ford, Ford I'm just I was having too much fun, Ford.com slash technology. You know why? Because I was learning something about streaming that I didn't even know. Here we are doing it, and I didn't even know but how That's the best part about this show is we learn so many things for what we do from yeah, our guests. Yeah, fascinating <laughs> stuff. And I, and I know probably uh, most of you are just glazing over, but Nick H30... <laughs> Who works in in, in in satellite and streaming and transport was fascinated in the chat room. We know, we know that you did not overgeek, Kevin. I would have stopped you if you did. We love that stuff. Uh, Ford.com/technology. Speaking of overgeeks, these are uh, we love advertisers that are geeks and Ford. Geeky is all get out. Thank you could probably thank Alan Mulally for that. Certainly, he uh, he really revitalized Ford when he joined as CEO. Some years back, he came from Boeing, where he was an engineer, designed the 777 cockpit. And all of a sudden, I don't know if it's a coincidence, all of a sudden, these Ford automobiles have the latest, greatest, coolest technology in there. Things like Ford Sync with My Ford Touch that gets you where you're going efficiently, effectively. 40, this is nice. You know, I, 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 with other GPSs, I'll, I'll do a point of interest or a POI search, and you never, they never have where you want to go. Now they've got 40, in the new uh, Ford My Ford Touch, 40 million businesses.
<laughs> Everything's in there. So you just say, I want to go to Twit. It not only knows where, it gives the phone number. You can make a call to Twit. It's got us on there. You know, I didn't check, but I'm sure it has. It's 40 million businesses. It must have us. It has everybody. They've obviously, you know, decided, you know, we really ought to get all of the databases at Foursquare and all these other companies. They probably use Simple Geo. That would be the way that I would well, do they it. they got the app platform. They got the app platform. That's exactly right. I mean, it, if, you, if you take a look, the idea here, of course, is to keep your hands on the wheel, your eyes on the road so you're safe, but you still communicate with the outside world, and Sync does it so well. You even have a way that if you're on Google Maps or MapQuest, you can send, you can plan like a 14-stop trip and send it to the car. Which, I love that because that's how, when I go on trips, I always start on Google Maps at home. Right. And then I have to reproduce it on my phone. Exactly. But you don't have to with this. You don't have to. You even have an account. They call it your... Uh, Sync traffic directions and information systems account, where it know you know you send that information to. It will do things. There's an app for Android and iPhone. It will send uh, that information to the app. You, it will text message you with traffic problems on your route that's coming up. Things like that. It's very sophisticated, very cool, and you have to have it in your next vehicle. But the only way to do that is to go to a Ford dealer right now and drive one. Ford.com/technology is the website, and I'm so excited. I'll let you ride in it. I got word I'm going to be getting that 2012 electric Focus. Oh, yeah? I'm excited. I think they got an influencers thing that Scott Monty said, oh, we'll get you on the list. Nice. So I'm excited. I cannot That's wait. Great. I'm really excited. You can take a look at the 2012 Ford Focus at your Ford dealer right now and see all the great stuff that uh, Sync and my Ford Touch does. Ford.com slash technology if you want to see it on the web. And we thank Ford for their support for triangulation. It makes it possible for us to interview great people like Kevin Marks. Of all the jobs, Kevin, that you've had, <laughs> all the places that you've worked, we're going to leave your current employer out because, of course, you, you would want to say them just out of, you know, being a, a good employee. Leave out Salesforce. We'll assume Salesforce. We'll assume That's Salesforce. That's right. red. <laughs> Which job was the most fun for you? Um, it's interesting. I mean, I, I, the, the startup thing is, is always the most energy. Sure um, and is. I got yeah. to do that twice. I did that with Multimedia Corporation, and that was that was very intense and discovering things and making stuff. I was to go along and inventing video before it could work. And I had got to do that again with Technorati with blogging and saying, "Oh, let's build a search engine. <laughs> How hard can that be?" Um, <laughs> so that was, you know, yeah. Well, I, as you say, I'll, maybe I'll come back and talk about that another time. But both both of those experiences, um, there was there was a. D d debate this week with um, Michael Arrington and Jamie Zawinski about working really hard is, is the essence of startups and whatever. Um, and and the Jamie pushed back and then Mike said, no, actually, being really obsessed with it is, is what the essence of startups is. And I think that's it. It's like, there's this thing that is fascinating um, and I can't wait to get up and work on that. And that feeling of intensity is, is enormously exciting. And got, I got to do that... Um, with the Motor Media Corporation, where we were, you know, making stuff out of whole cloth, and I got to do it again with with Technorati. With, with Apple, they, they, there was some there was some, some elements of that too. We were, you know, inventing things there, but it wasn't that same. There's, you know, ten of us in this room. We're going to make this thing. That 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 is always always a. But even thing. when you worked at BT and did Ribbit, that was <laughs> kind of your own thing within the big giant BT yes. sphere, right? So you're um, still, in a way, doing your own projects. Yes, no, I was still doing my own projects. But that, that you know, there, I, I came in after they'd been bought. They'd already, they'd, they'd been through that phase, and uh, I, okay. you know, that, that wasn't so my. So why not do another startup? Um, I'm, I'm getting old. Um, <laughs> What's the maximum age? Because <laughs> no, I, I, I think I hit it. <laughs> I, that, that's not fair. I think I, I you know, it, it's easy to do that stuff. It is easy to do that when you're younger. It um, is. But it's also yeah. finding the thing that you're, you're. You're obsessed about it enough to, 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 to do that. And one of the things I found um, working with, with, with Google and BT and Salesforce was there are other ways that you can um, make a dent in the world, change the world, by doing some of these things that um, you change the protocols and the ideas that people are using. That, and that, that's, that's been interesting too, without actually having to build everything yourself. Right. Part, of the, part of the value of the cloud worldview is you don't have to do everything yourself anymore. You can say, oh, there are all these PCs, I can join these up, mm -hmm. or there's a missing PC, we need to add something here, without having to do everything. You know, when we did the 3D Atlas, we, you know, we wrote the whole thing from the ground up in C. Um, we had a bit of operating system support on the Mac, we had a, a small amount of operating system support on the 3DO, but big chunks of that we were making up as we went along. You know, we had to design our own file formats, we had to design our own text layout engines, we had to do our own graphics mixing and blending, we had to, you know, build 
big chunks of stuff from scratch um, because you couldn't delegate that. And for the, the value of um, the cloud stuff is that you can now delegate big chunks of what you want to do to something that's either already been written in an open source way or a service that already exists that will do that for you. Yeah. So that that change has been has been you know, fascinating for me as well. Yeah, we've gotten to the point where collaboration uh, is really the key. It's an uh, object-oriented world. Yeah, you, yeah. I think it's fat. Well, it's, it's, it's more of a service-oriented world. It's service. Object -oriented. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Object orientation ends up really, really tightly bound, mm -hmm. um, you, you, because you've got to really know the API of stuff. Whereas right. now it's like we've got these abstractions that are, that are um, more flexible than that. Boy, I'd love you to have come back and we'll talk about that because that's a really interesting subject yeah, yeah. too. You just have to come back, Kevin. <laughs> I, I'd love to. Right. I always enjoy talking to you, Liam. It's really fun. Uh, Kevin Marks' uh, blog is at j.mp slash k. How about that? for a short URL. <laughs> Otherwise, it's, it's a payus.blogspot.com. It's either way, it's good. Well worth reading. He's a very thoughtful guy. Always a welcome guest on our shows. Uh, I, it's been, I, I've had a blog for 10 years now. I, I actually missed that. Um, so I need, I need to go and write, write some more essays. Yeah, blogging is, I, you know, it's an interesting thing. I just was reading Om Malik's uh, 10th anniversary blog yes, post. I just saw that. Too. Yeah, and it's inspiring. And it, and it really, it's true. If you do it continuously and you write a lot, as he does... Um, there's some, there's, you create a body of work that's a very interesting. Well, I, I find I do that. I, you know, I will, I will, I'll be talking about something and I'll, I'll, I'll send someone a link to a blog post I wrote five years ago because it's like, oh yeah, I, I've written about this before. And right. as I haven't been writing as many recently because I've been, you know, twittering more and doing more of these, these, these live things, um, it's, I'm, I'm probably sort of exhausting my store of like, oh, I've, I've, I've thought right. about this, written about it. So yeah, I should, I should. <laughs> See if I can write at least once a week as opposed to three times a day. <laughs> yeah, once a week would <laughs> so, be good. myself an achievable goal. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Great to talk to you. Kevin Marks, thank you for joining us on Triangulation. Thank you for being here. We do this show 4 p.m. Pacific time every Wednesday or whenever we get a great guest, uh, 7 p.m. Eastern uh, time. Uh, and I guess if I say 4 plus 12 is 16, add 9 is 3 a.m. UTC, which means no one's going to watch us in uh, in Britain. But you can always see it after the fact. But you UTC is handy live. for people in India. Yeah, no, I, that's why I do a UTC. It's all yeah. over the, all over the world. But if you are, uh, you know, if we're in the middle of the night for you, don't forget we have this no, on it's, on the it's web. It's midnight UTC. It's midnight. Yeah. Am I doing this all wrong now? 4 p.m. plus eight. Yeah. Oh, I am. Midnight. You had you did nine. I did not. But then you added You're thinking British time, but nevertheless, I screwed it up badly. So well, British time is UDC at this time of year. Oh, that's right, because it's summertime. Because the it's no not summertime. It's anyway, <laughs> <laughs> we just need one time zone for everyone. Uh, yeah, <coughs> I don't care what time of day it is. You can always watch us at twittv slash tri. Exactly. Right. There you go. Good story. Store and forward. Who needs streaming anyway? Thank you for being here, Kevin. Thank you all for being here. We'll see you next time on Triangulation.